is after this call. Hi, welcome to the Africa Biomass Challenge. My name is Amy. I am a data scientist at Zindi, and I've been working with an amazing team from GIZ, University of Zurich, um, Data 354, um, and it's been a long time coming to get this challenge out. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll answer them. For any French speakers, we do have Henrietta and Fabrice who are French speakers and can answer your questions in French. So please put them in the channel. Um, this challenge is open for three months on Zindi. You can sign up already. I'm going to put the link in the chat so you can start signing up. But I'm going to hand over to Henrietta Waltz, who's the co component manager for Sustainable Cocoa Initiative at GIZ. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am sharing my slide and I'm sorry if you have some background noise. Uh, I'm uh, calling in from Abidjan um, and I'm currently at a, at a workshop. Um, I'm very happy to present um, the webinar today to kick off this kick off webin webinar. Um, we are. Uh, I'm starting to uh, with uh, setting the scene a little bit of the of the uh, topic of the webinar uh, and of the hackathon. Um, going right into the topic, um, the stakes of deforestation and reforestation are very high, um, and this is what this hackathon is about. Uh, you know the land use change problem. Land use changes are a problem and solution in global climate change debate and have only risen on the agenda over the last years. Um, according to the IPCC, they make up 13 to 21 percent of global GHG emissions. Um, and um, reforestation is very high on the agenda, also on the African um, continent. So, for example, here I posted the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative. Uh, where uh, African countries pledged to um, restore 100 million hectares of um, forest landscapes until 2030. Also in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, where I'm working and from where I'm calling in, where we are organizing this hackathon, um, deforestation. Henriette, the, yeah? the slides are not moving. We still see the opening slide. And we also see the presenter's mode. Oh. Oh, that's a pity. Um, okay, let me maybe share the then the. Um, I will try a different way of sharing and just share the um, whole screen and go into the presentation. Sorry about that. So now is it better now? Yes. Good, perfect. Okay. So yeah, as I said um, here, setting the scene a bit in Cote d'Ivoire, deforestation and reforestation is also very high on the agenda. Um, and especially also uh, cocoa driven deforestation and then reforestation in uh, cocoa plantations. Um, Cote d'Ivoire has lost um, a lot of its forests uh, since uh, 1960, independence 80%, but also over the last decades, uh, as you see here on the right. Um, but at the same time, there is a goal of um, restoring 20% uh, forest and tree cover in 2030 and agroforestry, so planting trees in cocoa plantations is one big um, means for this goal of 20% tree cover in 2030. Uh, so now we're talking about um, here trying to monitor deforestation and um, reforestation and um, you can ask the question why is that still difficult um, nowadays. Uh, first of all data collection on the ground on carbon uh, restoration or sequestration um, and biomass is very time and resource intense here on the on the bottom you see um, someone taking GPS location, someone 
estimating the height of a tree. Um, all the trees have to measure it in height, uh, size, species, etc. And especially in, in remote areas such as in, in rural Africa, this is very time and resource intense. Um, However, remote monitoring is also still difficult. It's um, not straightforward to distinguish tree cultures such as cocoa, palm oil, rubber, etc., from forest trees. It's also difficult to detect uh, trees under trees, and this is especially also relevant for cultures such as cocoa that can um, be planted under forest uh, cover or that can be planted with shade trees in agroforestry. Um, also, tropical regions are of, often cloudy. And as a last point, there's not sufficient reference data also because it is so difficult and um, time intense to uh, collect data. Um, but on this last point also, um, we have made kind of the observation that a lot of data is not uh, open and there are now a lot of service providers providing services on um, monitoring remotely such, such things as biomass, carbon, um, uh, agroforestry, etc. But often it's not uh, transparent how good uh, these systems are because the reference data is not uh, or um, yeah, the, the algorithms and the data is not public. So the objective of this whole activity was to facilitate remote monitoring of agroforestry and degradation of forests by first of all providing a high quality open source reference data set and by sparking innovations um, through a hackathon. That's what we're here for now. And if you look at um, kind of the scheme here, um, the quality of a certain uh, remote monitoring system depends on which input it is uh, getting. So the reference data uh, that is used to train the algorithms and of course the method. And uh, we thus invested in this reference data set and now in this hackathon we're looking at which method or algorithm um, can be used to. Uh, monitor. Just uh, quickly on the timeline, we collected the data in 2021, uh, presented it to the national partners in 2022, and now we're in the hackathon. And once the winners are presented, uh, we will then publish also the data set to everyone. We are very lucky to have a um, big consortium. Um, BINET uh, is our national institutional partner, um, very uh, important agency here in everything concerning data and statistics of the country. Uh, data 35, uh, 354, our um, Ivorian partner who will also present in a bit, um, partner of the government on open data issues, University of Zurich, who is uh, providing a technical support to the project, and Zindi, of course, as the host of the online ch challenge. And uh, we as GIZ um, do the coordination of the project. Um, we're presented by three projects, the um, um, Sustainable Cocoa Initiative, where I'm part of Fair Forward, uh, Artificial Intelligence for Development, and the Initiative for Sustainable Agricultural Supply Chains. Um, yeah, with this, um, I come to <laughs> present the question of the challenge, um, which is, can you predict biomass on cocoa plantations in Cote d'Ivoire based on JEDI and Sentinel data? This data will be presented in a second um, presentation just after this one. Uh, With this, I hand over back you. to Amy. Oh, perfect. We lost you just at the end. Um, thank you, Henrietta. If anyone's got any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. I'd like to hove over, hand over to Prof. Jan, Jan Berkner, who's a data science professor at the University of Zurich, and he'll explain how the data was prepared. Over to you, Jan. Yeah, hi. Uh, we can see and your screen and hear you. So hi everyone. 
So um, I will just quickly then three slides. Sorry, I will just try this again. All right, so the, the data set uh, consists of um, Sentinel-2 multispectral satellite images, which is the input data and is the reference data or label for you to train your models on. We use this NASA JEDI full waveform uh, LIDAR data and uh, the JEDI sensor is a laser scanner mounted on board of the International Space Station. And um, as reference data, um, we did collect the uh, biomass data on the ground through GIZ field campaigns. And this is part of the holdout test set where your submissions will be evaluated on. Just a brief overview of the two sensors, the Sentinel-2 satellites and the JEDI sensor. So the Sentinel-2 satellites uh, are a constellation of uh, two satellites of the European Space Agency with a revisit cycle of three to five days uh, of any place on Earth. Each image has a swath width of 290 kilometers. And the most important thing is that they are specifically tailored and designed to monitor vegetation. So each image has 13 spectral bands of um, 10, 20 respective 60 meter resolution. And they don't have any single pass stereo capabilities. So there's no depth that automatically comes with it. And then about the JEDI data. So as I said, so the JEDI um, instrument is a laser scanner that sends out the laser pulses onto Earth from space. And there is um, several different lasers that are mounted on uh, as part of the instrument. And we are using the two full power laser beams that we see on, on the right side here. So, and what you can also see that it's, uh, this laser scanner is not densely sampling the earth like a satellite images, but there are gaps between each and every footprint and in flying direction. So a long track, it's 60 meters and the cross track, um, we have 600 meters. So it's not a dense sampling. This is also why the data set that we provide is not, densely covering uh, the country, but we always cut out image patches around the JEDI footprints. And to be very precise, so the, the product that we give to you as a reference is um, from, this is this L4A product that you see in the screen box, here in this footprint level above ground biomass. And another important um, information is that this footprint diamet diameter is 25 meters on the ground. So it's quite much bigger than this pixel size 10 by 10 meter in the image patches. Yet if you want, want to know more, there's much more information on the internet on the um, NASA JEDI homepage. And uh, with this, I hand over to back to, to Amy. Thank you, Jan. Um... Again, any questions, put them in the chat or ask them at the end. Um, <laughs> I'd like to hand over to Mr. Bello now from BNETD, uh, who would like to explain the importance of biomass prediction in Côte d'Ivoire and the link with other projects. Mr. Bello, are you there? Yes. Hello, everybody. Yeah, over to you. Okay, thank you. Can I share my screen? Please. Give me a second. Can you share now? Let me try. Yes, one minute. Okay. We can see your screen. Is it okay for you? Yes. Okay. So, hello everybody. My name is Belo Ajadi, and I'm from Bennett. Bennett stands for Bureau National Detective Technique and Development. It's in Cote d'Ivoire. And I have five minutes to talk to you about the importance of biomass prediction for Cote d'Ivoire and the links with Bennett projects. 
So, for Cote d'Ivoire, can you see my screen, please? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. So, it's very important for a country like Cote d'Ivoire to have some information about our biomass because for because of the huge loss, loss of forest and biodiversity accurate information on biomass is very helpful for us also for forestry and land use carbon management and climate change adaptation also predicting the biomass could help us to be estimate the potential economic value of our resources and plan the sustainable use the main initiative and project links to biomass data in Cote d'Ivoire are the Red Plus Initiative, our National Greenhouse Gases Inventory, our National Forest Inventory, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative, the Thai is a national park, so the National Park of Thai Emission Reduction Project with the World Bank. We also have a, a Climate Smart Agriculture Project in Cote d'Ivoire and a very large project program called Forest Investment Program. They are in the second phase now. And Côte d'Ivoire is also part of the NDC support program. What about Bennett now? So Bennett is a design office created to contribute to the development of Côte d'Ivoire. And we are also in other countries in Africa. So our main responsibility is to design, monitor studies, and to, to manage some project of public works. And our main, uh, main role is to advise our government of Côte d'Ivoire, mainly in the implementation of road, water, and energy infrastructure. But since some years now, Bennett is working on land mapping, agriculture, and forestry projects also. We also can work for private entities if required. So as I was saying, as Bennett is one of the government important companies, we work on all the major programs and projects in which the Côte d'Ivoire is involved in. So in the forest investment program, Red Plus, the FLECT, FLECT is a, a program on forest governance, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative. And recently we work on the land satellite surveillance. And also we are, working now on the land use map, the 2021 land use map. We also recently work on the a study of drivers of deforestation and forest degradation and determination of future hotspots of deforestation. So saying that, we all can see that it's important for a company like Bennett to have some up-to-date information, up-to-date technology to work on all these projects. I had five minutes to talk about it. It's not enough, but I think that if you have some question, I could clarify a little, a little bit more what I've said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vela. Um, I feel like there's never enough time to talk about your passion. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to hand over to Fabrice Zapfakna, um, CTO of Data354. Fabrice will be walking us through the baseline model or the tutorial that's on Zindi. So if you've got any questions about the tutorial, now's your time to pay attention and ask. Over to you, Fabrice. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Uh, so I will just quickly uh, go through the baseline that we, uh, we added on, um, on Zindi. So can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Perfect then. So, so the idea is just to give you, well, with this uh, baseline, we wanted to make accessible to almost everyone to start on the project. So we just wanted to have quick, uh, quick stuff to be easily be able to do a submission. So I was, uh, like you mean, we might not, so we just start by just extracting, downloading the data. So um, all the data are provided on the Zindi platform. So you have, you'll be able to, use, uh, when you use this, uh, this notebook, for example, to uh, quickly uh, download the data. So here we have all the training data set that we have, we have, we have separated in the training, a validation and a test set. A, a test set. 
Um, so to give some quick insights about the data, so the training data set has um, more than 25,000 images. Uh, the validation part, uh, the validation part is all is around uh, five uh, five thousand, and the test is five thousand also. So in the um, to train the model, we provide you uh, like Jan mentioned uh, earlier, we provide you the Sentinel two images on different locations in Cote d'Ivoire, and you have also the target the the biomass that is supposed to be uh, to be uh, uh, predicted. But we also add uh, as a way to help you train the model or as also information, the cloud. So how much cloud do you have on each pixel of the image? And also the latitude and the longitude of each part where the data was collected. And you also have uh, the information provided by Sentinel-2 about the classification of, the, of each pixel. Uh, so just a quick way to display the image if you want to display one image, but. Uh, uh, as Yan has presented, so these are not um, these are Sentinel two images, and Sentinel two. Uh, so you have different bands, so you can you can have RGB bands, but you have also different bands. So I, um, you can have the documentation of Sentinel two to have a more description of the different bands, and to present what you have as biomass. So this is the biomass of the first image in the data set. So 99. So this is the order of magnitude of the different um, um, of the different biomass we have. Uh, then we come to something. So what, uh, what we want you to do, guys, uh, all the participants, we want you to be creative. So you have to do a lot of exploration of the data to understand what type of data you have and try to propose um, uh, things. Uh, try to do things uh, with, uh, to help you resolve the problem as much as possible. So for example, you will want to explore different stuff about the, the problem you have. Uh, we show you one example about skewness. So all this code is just to help you maybe, for example, uh, understand the, the skewness of the data band uh, on every different bands of uh, Sentinel-2. Uh, if, if I go directly to the, to the, uh, to the image, uh, we have plot there. The, the skewness of each band, of the data in each band. So you can see, for example, uh, if you look at the, the blue lines, the, uh, that, uh, the, that the data is very skewed. So uh, what you can do when you have positive skewedness, for example, is to do a square root. So this is the type of uh, intuition you wanted to have, like explore the data, find insight, and then find ways to help you um, better manage your data. So for example, if we, for positive skewedness, we do a square root, we see that the skewedness has decreased. So this is just an example. That's the type of thing we wanted to uh, highlight in the, in, in, the, in the baseline. And then let's go to the first, to the, 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 the funny part. So uh, if you want to train a model, uh, we have provided you a quick example on how to train a model. Um, so we went uh, with uh, scikit-learn, but feel free to use any uh, in, 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 uh, any any data science tools that you might need, uh, for example, PyTorch, TensorFlow, any any anything. Uh, so we want to make it simple. So what we did is I will just first go uh, present you there the pipeline we are doing with the data. So first of all, uh, we just did a simple transformation for a custom scholar. So we want we just want to normalize the data. And then we are just going to flatten the data. So we are just going to have one column representing any pixel in our data. And then we are just trying to, um, to, to, to train a, um, a simple uh, linear model. So all the code to do that is provided here. So we, are, we just use the custom um, transformer uh, API provided by scikit-learn, the, the library. So we created it first a uh, transformer to, to do the, uh, the normalization, the, the rescaling, and then another transformer to do the flatten. So to have one column representing any pixel on the image. And then this is how you can create a pipeline where you put everything together. So you do the normalization, then you do the flattening, and then you create a, uh, you, you, you do a linear regression on the data. Uh, we chose the last two techniques for that. So when you want to do that, you can then fit the model. 
uh, if you are familiar with scikit-learn, you will know the, this type of API, so you can feed the pipeline then. And then you can use the pipeline when the, when the pipeline is fit, is fitted. Now you can use it to, for prediction and then predict on the train images created earlier. And when you have predicted, you can, you can then um, uh, compute the, um, the score of the model. So you can evaluate the model. So like uh, the, the evaluation score you can see on the, in the Zinji platform, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the score used for the, mod, for the competition is the RMSC, so the root square, the, the root mean square error. So you can compute it using uh, this type of uh, this code. So for example, to use um, uh, scikit-learn to compute the mean square error and then do is the root square of the mean square error and then have the error. So if you just do a simple uh, model like this, you will have a mean square error of 54 on the test set we provided uh, using the training data set. And uh, this is for the, um, the, the train, the train, uh, the, 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 the score you have on the train images. And then if you want to try it on the validation, you will have 52. So was um, then the train for it. This is just normal. And if you want to improve the model, well, one way you can do it is to do a grid search. So for fine tuning the, uh, first of all, to compare different type of classifier of, uh, of model. Uh, here we use a simple linear regression you can try to use a rich model if you want to have penalties to the linear regression. Uh, you can use a lasso, or we also um, put here a, a neighbor regression, um, a key, um, a key neighbor regressor to perform um, um, uh, uh, if you want to use this type of model. And then you can also uh, fine tune the uh, change test different uh, hyperparameter for your for your model. Uh, for the which, for example, we change the value of the parameter the hyperparameter alpha, and we provide three for example three uh, three values 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and and one. So these were just arbitrary uh, chosen to help you just see how you can fine tune your you can um, select the hyperparameter of the model. And then when you have all these parameters listed here, you can then uh, just create, as we did before, the pipeline of the model. Uh, we just clean it. Uh, the pipeline should be something like this. Sorry for the error. <laughs> so you have a pipeline. So it, like we said, it's just a rescaling, flattening, and then a regular, uh, a, um, I don't know, this is not the word code. So you can just use all these parameters inside the grid search. So the grid search is just going to run um, for each uh, value of the parameter you put here and for each uh, model, it's just going to perform a, train the model and then, and then yeah, and, and train the new, a new model. You just do it by creating the pipeline, adding um, the parameters, and then um, define how you want to do cross-validation and then uh, use a, uh, a scoring model for, for that. And when you have your grid search, you can just easily train all your different models inside the grid search using the dot .fit uh, API of scikit-learn. So it's going to take some time uh, for depending on the model you put and the, the, the function you want to do, but at the end, you will be able to have a uh, different model train and to select the best model. Like for example, we have uh, we were able to select to see that uh, with the parameter we put here, uh, the best model was a lasso with the uh, with the value of the alpha type parameter uh, zero dot one. And and then when you have this model. Uh, this good model, you can evaluate the performance of the model um, on the train set or, or the validation set. So you can see that, for example, this model uh, where you have done a, um, a model select, we have performed a model selection, has an error, uh, R, M, M, uh, a root mean square error of, of 52.9, uh, which is better in the train set, which is better than the one we had before. And in the validation set, we have 
76, which is also better than the 62.94 we had before. And you can also evaluate the model on the on, on the test set because the test, the test set was not used to uh, uh, select the, the, the hyperparameter of the model. And if you want to do a proper evaluation, you can use the test set we provide in the training set. So this is uh, how you can train the model. And now, when you have a model and that you are in that, uh, and that you are happy uh, and want to test on Zinzi on the leaderboard to compare with others, um, we are also provide you some codes to to compute the uh, the submission file. So to do the submission file, you will first have to download the the image the, the images uh, test uh, that uh, are used for the the images that are used for the test set. Uh, so these images. Uh, you can easily uh, okay download it like that. Um, we provide your code to make it um, to create the the, the numpy array uh, to be able to use them. When you have your model, you can easily just use the API uh, and then the function project to project to do your projection, and then and then um, use this uh, this um, uh, CSV file. To have for each uh, identifier of the image, uh, add the, the projection, and this is how you you come up with this uh, with this data frame. So where you have in the first column the ID of the image, and in the second column the the value of the of the the biomass the model has projected, um, and then you can just um, export this. Um, this uh, data frame inside the CSV file and submit it on Zinzi. Um, make, uh, I also added um, a way for you to quickly check if the format of the file is, uh, is similar to the format that, the, uh, that you should be able to, uh, to submit on Zinzi. So you can just print the, if I print the five lines of the file we just created, uh, we just created, and the five uh, and a sample submission that is provided on the Zinzi platform, uh, we, we can see there that the format is the same. So we please make sure that your format is always the same before submitting to Zinzi. So if you have any other question, feel free to add it on the chat. So I give the floor to you, Amy. Amazing, thank you, Fabrice. I'm glad you came to the call, Johnson. Yes, so this is a prediction of biomass using Jedi and Sentinel data. We've got some questions from Leonardo. Uh, I think I'm going to read it out and then Jan and Fabrice, you can maybe answer. Can we use info such as cloud, latitude, longitude? Apart from the image to train, apart the image to train and test, or can we simply just use the image? Okay. So I think the answer to this is you can just use the image um, in the notebook that's imported. But if you think that there is extra useful information in the cloud and latitude and longitude files, you are more than welcome to incorporate those. The second question I'm going to direct at Henrietta. Uh, Amy, if I can ask something uh, uh, regarding this question. So yes, please feel free to, uh, to use this information. And also, uh, you can even provide uh, to uh, this information can also help you to get more data in the, uh, to to help you uh, better uh, do better projection. So feel free to use it, to use them, uh, especially uh, the location. Uh, they might be able to to provide you more context about the the data you have. Thanks, Fabrice. And yet. There are approximately 5,000 images to be downloaded. However, the test set only has 90 images. Um, why was the challenge set up this way? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the idea is uh, to 
um, develop the data on the basis of the um, images of the 5,000 and then to, to be able to predict um, the situation on the ground. It's very, as I said, time and uh, money intense to um, collect this data. So you can imagine here in, in Oh no, Henrietta, you've just cut off. We can't hear you. Do you want to repeat the last minute? Otherwise, I can answer the, the question. So it is just very tedious and costly to collect the biomass ground truth data because the crews and of experts have to drive everywhere in the country and collect the data. And we sit and basically didn't have more funding to collect all those images. So uh, to collect all this 90 uh, biomass ground truth plots. So that's the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the reference data. So not the images, but getting the ground truth reference of biomass on, on the ground. And we, we try to collect more and more over time, but this is just what we had for, for this challenge. Thanks, Jan. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? We're going to sit on the call for another five minutes. Oh, thank you, Leonardo. Is there a maximum value for the biomass ground truth data? So maybe I can answer this again. So no, there is no maximum value. Just go with the values that the Jedi provides you. And that it's a, it's a very nice sample of the training data that you would also expect to see in the test data. So it's it's neither above nor, nor below that. So it's within that range. So Leonardo, no max and no min. Uh, but if you look at the train data, it will give you a good range to start with. Have any of the people on the call started the challenge yet and want to give some insights on what you've found so far? I know you all have your secret sauce, but if you're willing to share a little bit, this is your time too. Thinking, we haven't really, um, uh, we haven't really presented the um, framework of the um, of the challenge. It's running until end of May, right? Twenty first of May, and um, the winners will be um, presented as the at the Earth Vision uh, workshop. Uh, in June, maybe Jan can say a bit more on that. And the prize winners, the first winner will get five thousand dollars, the second three thousand, and the third two thousand. Just um, to say the this framework, uh, I think we haven't really shared that before. Okay, yeah, happy to to quickly say something. So the Earth Vision Workshop is a annual workshop at the world's most prominent computer vision conference, conference, which is called CVPR. So CVPR takes place every year um, in the US, um, approximately 10,000 people attending and the, the top machine learning computer vision people are there. And the Earth Vision Workshop basically is about remote sensing and applying computer vision machine learning methodology to remote sensing. 
and um, I'm posting the website of our workshop um, into the, the chat. It will take place in Vancouver in June uh, this year. And um, when you have submitted your results until the end of May, then this leaves us three weeks approximately to evaluate everything and find out the winner. And then the winners will be announced at this Earth Vision workshop at uh, CVPR in, in Canada. Thanks for that additional info, Henriette. Um, Tao, I'm new to machine learning. Can I still participate? Of course you can. Um, all you need to do is sign up to Cindy and click on this link. You'll find all the information on the text. And underneath the data section, you will find that baseline model. So all you need to do is open that either in Python um, Anaconda on your local machine, or you can use Colab and you can start running the model and make your first submission on Zindi. Um, Leonardo, yes, you do need to submit the code. You're, if you are in the top 10 of the leaderboard, you will be requested to send in your code via email. You'll have 48 hours to prepare your code for submission. When you submit your code, it needs to, um, please don't give us throwaway code. Um, it's going to be well documented. If you look on the data page, you'll see that there's a baseline explained model. This shows the format of the documentation we need when you submit your code. So only the top 10 need to submit their code, but if you are the 50th person on the leaderboard, we encourage you to post your code on the discussion board so everyone can learn. Jan, do you want to expand on this? Uh, normally, just submitting the code as the source code in a zip file, but you can expand on that and send it in as a Docker image. Jan, would a Docker image be acceptable to you? Yeah, that's totally fine for us. I think if you would want to do both or either of them, for, for us, that's totally fine. It's just the thing that we, we are asking this for the top people such that we can have a look at it and we really see what is there anything novel, is there anything new? So if we would want to give some special attention during the award ceremony to some particular method, which was very innovative or creative, then um, this would be possible. So this is why, why we would want to look at your code. Uh, uh, if, I, if I can add some stuff, some stuff. Uh, I think yeah, the sharing the source code can be a very good idea. Uh, you can send a zip or even a GitHub. Um, that would be very uh, appreciated. Um, and Henrietta, just to confirm that the code winning codes will be shared publicly, or they will not be. I think they should be yes. Is that uh, um, also in line with what Zindi does? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so once the winners are confirmed, we will encourage the winners to post their solutions on GitHub as well as the discussion page. So um, everyone can comment, add, ask for help, um, and learn from each other. This is our first challenge combining, Zindi challenge combining Jeddah and Sentinel imagery. So the code that comes out of here is going to be real gold mine for challenges going forward. 
and we are really excited to see what you come up with. Um, Johnson, are there any further online resources for references purposes? Jan and Fabrice, do you want to add? Yeah, so uh, I can add. Um, so there's quite some research papers that combine JEDI data and um, remote sensing data for global canopy height mapping. So for example, we did something, if you look at my website at the ETH Zurich or University of Zurich, you will find it. You can also look at Google Scholar for um, JEDI data papers. So there's quite some that you can read and, and get inspired. There's also older papers around the 2000s that did use at the time uh, other biomass data, not JEDI, together with Landsat imagery or MODIS imagery and so on. So if you look on Google, Google Scholar, there's quite a lot. There's also some, some tutorials um, and you find also some links on the JEDI website from the University of Maryland or from NASA and, and so on. So there is a, quite a lot of, of online resources that you can read to, to get inspired. Yes, and to add, uh, to add also, you have a lot of tutorials, uh, like Jan, Jan mentioned, uh, using Sentinel-2 data for different type of problem, like regression, segmentation, that might be very helpful. And you will be able, able to find a um, pre-trained model, uh, ResNet, uh, a lot of model already pre-trained on some uh, Sentinel-2 data. So feel free to look around. There, is, there are a lot of resources available. If you find an interesting resource, uh, please do share it on the discussion board for others to learn and others to comment on saying that they found this useful as well and what they found. From Um, we're going to end the webinar here as I don't see any more questions coming through. So I really want to thank Mr. Bello, Fabrice, Jan and Henrietta for joining us today. This webinar will be uploaded, the recording, in 48 hours. So if you want to rewatch it or share it with friends, it'll be on the challenge page in 48 hours. Uh, good luck, everyone. Um, I hope to see you on the leaderboard. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Good luck. Bye. Good luck. Fingers crossed. <laughs> bye bye. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Bye. bye. Good luck.